Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar from my HR, which is going to be run by Maddie, one of our HR advisors here in my HR Australia, and myself, Megan, HR Solution Specialist. In today's session, Maddie's going to go through some of the upcoming changes in legislation that will affect businesses in Australia. There's quite a few, and I think this is a good informative topic for everyone. So, yeah, over to you, Maddie. Yeah, so we're just going to do a very high level overview of some of the topics that we felt would be most relevant um, to the kind of industries that we deal with at my HR and just, you know, the ones that are going to apply to the most businesses. Um, this is called Closing the Loopholes 2. So you may have been familiar with some of the changes that came through last year under the first part of the amendments. So this is just the second part of that. Um, and yeah, there are quite a few changes that are coming into place. So, you know, if you need any assistance in kind of understanding if any of these that we discussed today will apply to you or your business, feel free just to give us a call and we can kind of help you work through if there are any changes that you need to make to make sure that you're compliant. Um, a lot of these won't be coming into play until the later half of this year. So you do have time to kind of make sure that you are being compliant with some of these changes. Um, so, yeah, we'll be able to work through those today. Okay, amazing. Thank you, Maddie. Um, everyone, I'm just going to cover a couple of admin bits today before we kick off. Um, so this session is going to be recorded today. So if you do need to jump off, the recording will be available. Um, it'll be available in a couple of days on the My HR website and likely also will be sent to you by email. Um, any questions will also be recorded and available afterwards. So only use details you're comfortable sharing and submit questions anonymously is what we recommend. If there are questions, we will answer questions at the end in the Q&A on anything related to the topic or anything at all about My HR either submit them as we go through or pop them through at the end. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to start now. So today's topics that we're going to cover are the employee's right to disconnect, wage theft, casual worker rights, sham contracting and gig economy workers. So over to you, Maddie. Yeah, so the employee's right to disconnect, this is probably going to be one of the more topical ones that's coming out of closing the loopholes to and will apply to the most amount of people, I would assume. So basically, under the new rules, the employee will have the right to refuse to read or respond to contact from their employer outside of their working hours. So, you know, obviously, there's times when employees are requested to work outside of their hours. There's now going to be a few more, you know, um, restrictions around that. So, the things that are going to be considered are the reason for the attempted contact. So can it be dealt with in the morning, how the contact is made and the level of disruption that it causes to the employee. So sending an email after hours versus calling an employee is obviously a very different way of contacting them. Um, the extent to which the employee is compensated to remain available for additional hours. So are they paid overtime? <clears throat> Are they remunerated at a really high rate or are they really low, um, you know, really close to the minimum wage? Those are things that are being considered. Um, also, the nature of the employee's role and their level of responsibility. And then the employee's personal circumstances. Um, so, yeah, these are all things that are being considered when the employee, whether it's reasonable for the employee to um, reject the contact from their employer. Okay. Um, would I still be allowed to send my employees emails and messages after work even if I didn't expect a response from them but like would I still be able to send them any information or email or contact yeah, yeah absolutely and that's a good question and I think that's kind of where people are worried if it's going to blur the line because obviously as we've pointed out employees have different personal circumstances so some people might work different hours compared to what their direct reports or employees work because they've got you know kid pick up duties and stuff and they might log back on at 8 p.m just because they're sending something at that time doesn't mean that they're expecting a response to it. But basically, they, under these new rules, they can't expect a response to it unless the employee kind of falls into this category of they're remunerated accordingly or their level of responsibility is high enough to expect it. So mm -hmm. relatively junior workers probably wouldn't be reasonable to expect them to be available to respond to something at 8 o'clock at night, whereas you know yep. a managing director, a CEO, something like that, far more likely that they should be contactable during those hours. 
Okay. I guess another situation that could arise from this is if an employer sent an employee something that they said, oh, can you please look at this? We'll say the night before. Mm. And then perhaps the employee goes into work the next day and is asked, oh, first thing in the morning, did you look up what I just sent you or did you mention Mm -hmm. that? Like, how are they meant to navigate that if they don't have to reply? Is there still an expectation that they should have, you know, actioned that beforehand? I mean, there shouldn't be. Um, Even now, there really shouldn't be. But I know that with a lot of workplaces, there is. And I think the issue is what we're seeing is, especially with a lot of corporate businesses, they're kind of creating this false sense of urgency behind a lot of things. And at the end of the day, you know, unless you're a doctor or a surgeon, you're realistically not saving lives. So a lot of things probably can wait until the morning. There's obviously going to be the odd time here and there where something is really, really urgent and, you know, could have a detrimental effect to the business. Those sorts of circumstances, though, are few and far between, I would imagine, for your standard business. So I think it's just important to reevaluate what's actually important because is it worth breaching this to just send an email to an employee asking them to check something that realistically could wait until the next day? Okay. And I think... Yeah. Um, And... I think the reason that they have had to look at bringing this kind of, you know, um, rules in is because, you know, post-COVID, a lot of people work from home, work from their bedrooms. It's really blurred the line between work and home because a lot of the time your home is now your place of work as well. Um, And it's harder for people to be able to say no or to feel like they have a a, a disconnect from work and their personal lives. So I think it's really trying to bring that back in because, you know, back in the 80s, the 90s, when people weren't as contactable by email and by mobile phone, they could leave work and just really switch off. Whereas our generation, um, I think, finds it a bit harder with all the technology that we now have access to. It's easier and easier to be in people's spaces all the time. And employees just mm-hmm. need to now, um, you know, exercise their right to be able to have a, spa- a bit of space from work and, you know, leave work for work and home for home. Okay. Thank you, Maddie. Um, I'm just going to move on now to the next topic. Yeah. Cool, wage theft. So basically, um, under these new, under the new legislation, um, the intentional wage theft, or basically intentional underpaying of employees, will now be um, a criminal offence. Um, so it's important to note that this won't apply to people who have, you know, completely unintentionally underpaid someone or miscalculated somebody's pay, but it's where an employer is fully aware that they are underpaying someone or, you know, if somebody's pay is stipulated in an award, kind of purposely keeping them at a level below where they actually sit based on their experience to, you know, reduce their payments and stuff like that. Um, it also extends to the underpayment of superannuation. Obviously, with stuff like awards, super minimum wage, that sort of stuff changes every single year, you know, in June, July. So it can be kind of easy to let some of these things go and to not keep on top of it. But under this new um, amendment that's coming through, if you are doing that, you know, there's really no reason to not be compliant because everybody should know now when these changes come into place. Um, and, you know, be preempting that every year there's going to be a change and there's going to be an increase to wages. We all know what the super increases are for the next couple of years. So just making sure that you're being mindful of all of those changes and applying them to all of your employees annually just to make sure that you're not going to come, you know, under any of these penalties because they are pretty harsh. Okay. Um, What, for example, if an employer was unknowingly underpaying employees, what, what happens in that kind of situation? Yeah, so, I mean, they would have to show that they it wasn't intentional, that they didn't know, and I guess it is kind of hard to argue that when they're, all of the information realistically is available online. Um, you know, there's always salary benchmarking, there's awards, minimum wage, stuff like that, and then there's always services like ourselves where you can reach out and we can assist you in kind of making sure that you are being compliant with your salaries um, but yeah, it's just, it's as a business owner or as someone who's high level in a business, it's just important to make sure that you are keeping compliant with all of these things and keeping up to date with any changes. Mm-hmm. What could business owners or businesses in general do to prepare for these changes and what's coming in? Yeah, well, I guess, as I said, you know, annually, all of these 
you know, rates and awards and stuff yeah. update. That's in June, July, basically every single year. So it would be, you know, now in the lead up time, knowing that that deadline is coming, making sure that you are looking at where all of your employees sit, especially if your employees are award covered. A lot of the time they're like level in the award is based on their years of experience. So you can almost preempt that every year they're going to be going up in that and then the rates will be changing with the updates as well. So I think it's just making sure that you're doing kind of an annual review of those things. And if you are having annual reviews with your employees in terms of like performance reviews and stuff, it's kind of a great way to tie it in together and make sure it's kind of a reminder for you to check what they're being paid, you know, realistically in this economy as well employees are expecting a salary increase year on year Mm -hmm. even if there's no change to their roles so it's kind of a way to tie those processes in together and use that as your reminder to make sure that you are increasing them okay and yeah I guess just want to point out here some of the penalties um you know it can include imprisonment which is obviously a pretty harsh um, 10 years yeah 10 years in prison paying someone it's definitely not worth it um, and you can see here, like some of the fines are up in the millions. So, you know, for some, yeah. is it really worth it for saving maybe a couple of thousand, couple of hundred thousand a year to be liable for those sorts of penalties? I definitely don't think so. No. Um, but yeah, it's just about making sure that you're on top of these things. And obviously we understand that awards and, you know, that whole realm is really confusing and it's really hard to kind of understand where, your employees sit against an award and you know if they have degrees and qualifications like what does that mean um so you know i think it's one an opportunity to educate yourself with all of that stuff but two also you know engage with the party like us and we can help you make sure that you are being compliant with all those kinds of things okay great thanks maddie just going to move on to the next topic we're going to cover today Casual worker rights. Casual worker rights, yeah. So this one's really interesting. Um, Under the current arrangement, an employer has to offer their employee um, the opportunity to convert to permanency after six months of um, service, whereas under the new rules, the employee will have to approach the employer for this and the employer will only reasonably be able to decline the request if they can show that the employee only meets the definition of a casual so what that means is a casual is someone who you know may work like seasonally only work a couple of shifts here and there it's never the same days every week whereas starts to blur the line between casual and you know permanent when say somebody's working Monday Monday, Wednesday Friday every single week same shift six months in a row um, they then would have the expectation to reasonably have that ongoing systematic regular employment you can't really argue that that person is then a casual if that's Mm -hmm. kind of the arrangement of their shifts. So that's kind of where it starts to blur the line. Um, And, you know, with casual employees, obviously they're not getting any of the benefits of being permanent. So they're not getting annual leave. They're not getting, you know, um, yeah, any leave entitlements, stuff like that. Um, They are typically compensated at a slightly higher rate though, which is worth pointing out um, than their permanent counterparts and that's why some people enjoy being casual and it also does provide a bit more flexibility and that really does suit some people's you know lifestyle Um, but there are obviously people out there who would prefer to have um, the stability of a permanent role so you know I guess now the employer has to offer it moving forward the employee will have to ask for it Mm -hmm. but it's harder for the employer to say no is kind of the summary of that Um, and there will be a greater onus to provide the employee with the casual information statement so currently that happens at the time of hire and at six months whereas moving forward it will be time of hire six months for a large business and then 12 months and then annually after that for everybody and the casual information statement basically just summarizes what a casual employee is And it's kind of for the employee to check over and, you know, kind of assess, do I still meet these guidelines? Because it will just explain, you know, are you regular and systematic? If you are, you basically probably aren't a casual employee anymore. So, yeah, just um, more onus on the business to provide the employee with that, which I think is meant to be kind of a prompt for the employee to and the employer to kind of look at where they're sitting. Yeah. 
Where can businesses get that casual information sheet? So it's available on Fair Work, um, okay. but also, um, you know, as part of our processes, when um, we have a casual employee um, start, we provide a copy of the casual information statement with their employment agreement. We're also now working with our development team to figure out how we can regularly um, provide that to the employees at the timelines that have been stipulated under the Fair Work um, Amendment. So making sure that our you know clients are being compliant with that as well. Okay. Um, why... Why has the new definition of casual employment, why has that come into place at all? Um, my understanding is that um, a lot of businesses will try and keep, keep people casual for as long as they can. Um, it's obviously easier to terminate somebody's employment if they're casual. Um, there's not as much of a requirement for the notice period. And as I mentioned, they don't have to pay any benefits like leave entitlement. So somebody's off sick or wants to go on annual leave or you know take a holiday, they don't have the annual leave the business doesn't have to pay for them to be off during that time. So it's a lot cheaper for a business to have casuals, but there's kind of a risk on both sides because as much as it's a risk for the employee to not have the promise of ongoing employment, the employer could be left in the lurch if all their casual employees just quit because they don't have to give a notice period like a permanent employee does. So they could be, you know, one day just lose all their staff essentially. So it's kind of multi, I would say it's beneficial to both parties to have the permanent side of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, sham contracting. Sham this contract. is an interesting topic. Yeah, it is an interesting topic. The world of contracting is very interesting and I think is, you know, employers are opting more for contracting. Um, and, you know, in under Closing the Loopholes Part 1, they did a lot of changes around the fixed-term contracts side of things. So I think this is really just like rounding out the whole process. But essentially, sham contracting is where a company intentionally misrepresents someone who should be defined as an employee as a contractor. Um, and it's kind of similar to how we just talked about casuals in the sense that, you know, there's no leave entitlements. Um, you typically don't have to pay superannuation for a contractor. They usually have to contribute that themselves. So it's, again, it's cheaper for a business to have a contractor. They have a lot more flexibility because, you know, they're not covered by like an award or anything around, you know, deciding the rate of pay that they want to pay somebody Um, you know there's a lot more flexibility around notice periods and just being able to terminate the agreement um, basically at any time so under this new amendment the Fair Work Commission will be looking more at what the actual nature of the working relationship is rather than just looking at the contract that's been put together because essentially you can put anything in a contract it doesn't mean it actually represents what's taking place um, and what the arrangement actually is so they're already pretty tough on this, um, but they are putting in more penalties. Um, and I've got them written down here. They are pretty harsh as well. Um, so it can be up to 93,000 for individuals. Um, 93,000 for individuals. Um, and for body corporates, it can be up to 469,000 for um, smaller penalties and then the maximum penalties are going up to 939,000 so oh, wow. you know, close to a million dollars um, of, and it's you know going to be looking at underpayments stuff like that so it's just really clamping down on you know how employees are treated um, and trying to make it a more fair arrangement for those people who are often put into contract roles and you know it's important to note that Basically, somebody should be on a contract if they are contracting to you to provide a particular service. So say your business wanted to build a new website, you could contract a software developer. The main or you know, the, the main point of the agreement or the contract is for them to build the website for you. So as soon as the website's built, it's done. Whereas if you had an internal software developer, they might assist with stuff like that, but they will also be running lots of other internal processes, day-to-day stuff, and they can be delegated tasks by their managers, whereas the contractor is solely there to build the website and, you know, they don't have a manager. They're not reporting to anyone. They'd be, you know, providing updates of their work to whoever the contract is with, um, but it's a very different working arrangement. Okay. Why would an employer do this at all? Why would they engage in this? 
it's easy for them to terminate someone. It's cheaper for them. Um, you know, there are kind of lots of reasons. Sometimes people will try to do this if, you know, a lot of businesses work off headcount. If they can't get headcount for a role, but they can put someone in the role for like a contract, then, you know, they can still have the person in to do the job, but they don't have that person as a guaranteed headcount. And then obviously, again, as I mentioned, it's easier to terminate them, but that's not really fair on the employee if they're being employed kind of under false pretenses. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I'm um, just going to move on to our final slide today, everyone. So this is on gig economy workers. Yeah, gig economy workers. Mm -hmm. So the kind of work that we see this as being most applicable to or is probably just the easiest to give you an example of is food delivery drivers. Um, so, you know, you order something, you order food through an app, the restaurant makes it, someone picks it up and drops it off to your house. That's kind of these people that we're talking about here. Um, it is also kind of defined as someone where a worker has been hired through an app to undertake work for a third party. Um, so, you know, that can be, you know, artists, personal shoppers. There are other kind of random jobs that fall into that category. Um, and basically what they're looking to do is give the opportunity for these types of workers um, to come forward and present what they think would be a minimum standard order. So it can be, you know, minimum rates of pay. Do they want entitlements like leave balances, stuff like that? Because at this point in time, my understanding is most of this is just like an hourly rate of pay or, you know, kind of commission off of you know, dropping off food and that sort of stuff. So there's not really, it's not really regulated at the moment. Um, so yeah. it's kind of a free for all um, and there's no minimum standards in place. Why hasn't there been anything in the past for this type of role? I think because it kind of exploded so quickly, you know, yeah. five, especially 10 years ago, this sort of role didn't exist at all. So it's kind of uncharted territory and it, yeah, expanded very, very quickly. People wanting to use food apps is very much just something that's popped up in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of the people who are doing this are doing this because they need to make extra money on the side. They can't get a job in another industry because they don't have any qualifications. So you're dealing with people who are already kind of minimum wage workers yeah. um, and then they're being kind of taken advantage of because there's no standards in place to regulate what they should be getting paid and basically giving them rights or even a body to kind of go to to raise complaints so that's what this is looking to achieve is to give them the forum to do that so basically it means that you know a company or a group of people could come together put together a proposal of what they think would be reasonable and then present it to the fair work commission and they'll review it and potentially put that in place for that business or for that type of worker so that it would probably be similar to an award yeah. in the sense that it would stipulate, you know, or a union kind of stipulate what minimum entitlements there should be for those roles. But mm. it's kind of this one they haven't given much information about yet and it's still unclear, you know, what the pathway would look like. How do they put together a proposal and then present it to the Fair Work Commission? Like they said that you can do that, but how easy is it for them to actually do that? So it would be interesting to see any updates that come through from that one as well. Okay, interesting. Are there any other industries affected by this bar, like food delivery drivers? Yeah, so I think um, their truck drivers and stuff fall under this category, depending on the nature of their employment arrangement as well. Personal shopping, um, sometimes like the creative industry, art, that sort of stuff. But I think the main one um, is definitely those delivery drivers. Okay. Well, what does that mean for business owners who are engaging gig economy workers? Well, at the moment, it's really just third parties. So I think yeah. until anything comes into place, they really don't have to change what they're doing. Although it would be great if, you know, we saw some initiative from some of these larger companies actually coming forward and putting this sort of thing in place for their workers because you would think they would want to have a safe working environment because, you know, nobody at this stage is controlling how many hours these people are working. Um, you know, is it safe that they're working, you know, 10-hour days? driving around in a car or a bike or something, you know, who's looking after these workers if there's WHS risks involved with that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's just a very unregulated industry at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Maddie. Um, I think that's that's everything. 
Um, we're finished up a little bit earlier today, guys, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A chat or likewise reach out to Maddie or myself after this event. Um, we'll also, the recording like that will be send it out to everyone. And yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. And yeah, um, as Megan said, you'll be sent a copy of this. But yeah, if you want to understand how any of these changes would potentially impact your business, feel free just to give us a call and we can have a conversation about that. Amazing. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.